So what I'd like to do is just begin with a meditation. Uh, and, you know, we, as we all know, we kind of sit upright as much as practical, take a few deep breaths, you know, holding them uh, as long as comfortable, not ever distracting ourselves by a physical strain uh, from these things. And, and so uh, in this meditation, we're gonna ask you to uh, turn your consciousness inward uh, and it very much relates to the kind of topic of, uh, again, today's presentation. Uh, so what we're asking you to do is we're going to focus on our own consciousness. Uh, you know, if in many ways, it's the most immediate thing that we know. It's the perhaps only absolute thing that we know. You know it's, it's Descartes' cogito ergo sum, I think, therefore I am. And so we have the absolute immediate awareness of our own existence. And that is the absolute truth for us. Uh, so it's been said that if one knows self, one will know the universe. And uh, our esteemed, uh, inspiring uh, mystic philosopher, Louis Claude de Samatan, uh, made a very interesting point, a very profound point, uh, where he said in his writings, the door by which God goes out of itself and enters the human soul, and the door by which the human soul goes out of itself, it enters the consciousness. And so let us focus on what we absolutely know, which is our consciousness, and, and understand it as the door. It's the door to take us back into the soul and the soul to our awareness of the creator and the absolute. Now in Eastern uh, uh, metaphors very often, our consciousness, the human consciousness, the human awareness is sometimes referred to as a, it's a, 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 a bubble on the surface of the ocean, right? Uh, and you know, as that bubble, one cannot sometimes know from you know, whence one comes and how one is supported, et cetera, but one is actually part of the, the sea, the same sea, the same ocean, and no one is ignorant of it. And so in this meditation, we want to turn our consciousness back to the absolute that we can know. And that is, let us turn it on self as that door to knowing the universe. So again, let's turn our consciousness away from the outer sensory information, outside of perhaps my voice at this point, the outside of the sensory information that so often occupies our consciousness. And let us look to crawl down, dig down into the roots of our own consciousness. Let's do it with resolution, determination of sorts, to begin to kind of go deeper and deeper into our own consciousness, and seek out the source of our own being. Let us focus on that one absolute that we know, our own consciousness, our own awareness. Bring aside everything but that. Let's concentrate on it, let's study it. In a sense, as, as a doorway going deeper into our own being, the absolute source of our existence. Mm -hmm. 
we know self or know the universe. And let us sense the universe within its consciousness. The universe is within us. Our consciousness envelops it. So would it be? So, uh, Fred and Soros, uh, the um, title of this presentation is Consciousness and Reality. And uh, it really, the, the subheading of it, which is really what ins inspires the, the thoughts, uh, i say that has given risen to the thoughts in it and reflections on it, uh, comes from uh, the Rosicrucian ontology uh, that we hear in our lodge and chapter convocations. And there's a point as the chaplain is describing kind of the manifestation of that which we know as the world or the universe and reality. Uh, it speaks of being. And as it, its kind of operation unfolds, uh, we hear the phrase, mind assigned a dimension. So uh, that phrase, mind assigned a dimension, the, the, the aim here is to explore that phrase. Uh, and, and reflecting on it and, and I would imagine there's a thousand more reflections, believe me, uh, that are more likely embedded in that phrase. Uh, uh, but it, it drew my attention to the way in which uh, uh, our mind uh, kind of uh, defines the universe for us. It creates the reality that we experience. And that, uh, that's, that's a created reality. And we're reminded of this in our atria degree monographs when we're told that everything is vibration. Everything is vibration. And, but we recognize these things in all sorts of forms, trees and books and rocks and uh, things we can touch and taste and smell. But we're told that uh, everything is vibration. <clears throat> and for those who have an interest in, in uh, the, the physical sciences, uh, we have found that that's where the current scientific understanding has, has, has gone to. That everything uh, we see in the kind of material universe uh, is coming out of uh, what people would call a quantum field of energy and this energy uh, vibrates uh, at, at different frequencies and uh, gives rise to the particles that uh, we hear about protons and neutrons and electrons and uh, a dozen other particles at least. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, our experience of reality is quite different than this. 
And if we want to get at actuality, which is what the traditional distinction Rosicrucians make between uh, that what something appears to be <clears throat> or the individual reality that a person experiences and well, what is it in its actual nature? So there's a place where mind, which kind of interacts with the brain and the physical system or senses, gives rise to a particular perception of the universe or of the created universe as, uh, at least as we experience it. Uh, without modern science, or the last couple of hundred years of it at least, uh, most of humanity uh, would take that what they see as being an absolute truth, an absolute reality, something that is unchangeable and is the same uh, no matter uh, who's looking at it or, or you know, how one weighs it or what are the circumstances. Uh, even time and space, which we get we review very early in the H to be monographs where we learn and science corroborates. There's lots of easy examples to illustrate it. Uh, but time and space are not absolute realities either. Right? Uh, time is kind of mitigated uh, by, by travel, the speed of movement. Uh, and so if one moves fast enough, time slows up. And even if one is just moving at all, it, it, is, it is slowing uh, time relative to that which is not moving. Uh, the reasons we don't perceive this is that our senses are not fine enough. But from you know, basic physics, and this is used in GPS navigation systems as a fact, which allows us to you know, drive our cars around and land airplanes, etc., and many other things, uh, but those are facts. But our normal sensory perception would not reveal these facts to us. So what we want to do is, is kind of explore this uh, relationship between mind and, and the reality that we experience. And that's kind of what we we'll to do a bit today. Uh, so uh, I'm going to ask Karen to put up a wonderful slide that actually uh, Sora Karen Walk shared with me about a year or so ago, and I think it, it uh, it's inspiration, it's inspiring. Uh, it underlies, and we'll come back to this image, not to study the image per se, but I think you'll find the image is illustrative of of what we talk about together with this presentation. So uh, I'm going to see if Karen has managed to do that. Yes, she has. Uh, wonderful. Uh, so I'm going to focus on four basic ideas to begin with. The first is our reality is a minuscule piece of possible realities. Second, our reality is primarily shaped by sensory information and our interpretation of it. Third, we passively and actively create our, create our reality through the power of our mind. And fourth, all reality takes place in our consciousness. So again, the first is our reality is a minuscule piece of possible realities. Our reality is primarily shaped by sensory information and our interpretation of it. That is truly mind assigned at dimension. Right? So this vast cosmic universe that you know, came about as uh, being expanded, uh, but our reality is primarily shaped by our sensory information and our interpretation of it out of this vast whole. And we passively and actively create a reality through the power of our mind. And I would say uh, perhaps one of the more important uh, thoughts is all reality takes place in our consciousness. 
It's likely the most seminal idea, uh, surely, of, of what's in this presentation, but I think uh, it's just a seminal idea for all of us as mystical students. So in the Rosicrucian ontology, uh, we're told that we exist in an infinite sea of vibratory energy, which Rosicrucians use the term spirit to describe or to label. Right. So this energy field encompasses the entire range of vibrations. Wherever you are located, whatever room you're seated in right now, there's all sorts of energy at different vibratory rates passing through the space that you're occupying, passing through your body, uh, and everything around us, passing through the earth as well, some of it. Uh, the reality is if you're seated in a room, there are radio and the transmissions from radio and TV stations from over the earth, either faintly or very strongly present all about you and actually even penetrating through you, your physical body. Uh, in addition, uh, and then there are you know, there's an app for this, not surprising, because there's an app for most things, right? But anyway, there's an app. But if you wanted to look at the cell phone and Wi-Fi emanations that are uh, touching where you are seated right now, that your phone, your cell phone is able to enable you to perceive, uh, you would see that in the room you were seated, even though your cell reception may be poor, uh, there's a ton of radio waves that are passing through the space that you're in, microwaves from Wi-Fi, uh, and electromagnetic waves from, uh, uh, from that come from outside of the earth passing through where we're seated. So again, we exist in an infinite sea of vibratory energy. We're just ignorant of it, right? We're insensitive to it. And a little bit, if you kind of go back to this image, is trying to point out to us at least this particular use of it, uh, that here we are uh, in the midst of all of these things and this energy is passing through us. And uh, if we kind of look at optical and radio telescopes, uh, and we're likely familiar with big optical telescopes that go you know, on the top of mountaintops in Hawaii and Chile and other places and, and radio telescopes, uh, and they are, from kind of the, uh, I'm gonna say lay perspective, everyday person's perspective, they are see, looking out into space, but the reality they aren't. They are simply designed to be sensitive enough to pick up both the light uh, rays or waves, as well as other electromagnetic radiation that is actually striking where we're seated in our rooms or outside, if we go outside and that are striking those particular instruments that have been created, those physical instruments of metal and silicon and other things. They're not looking out into space. They are simply registering and being able to make perceptible to our senses this energy uh, that is coming uh, and reaching us from, in many cases, even billions of light years away. So, it isn't again that they're looking out. It's all of this is here. It is, it is over our heads at this very moment if we walk outside. Uh, yes, if it's daytime, uh, the brightness of the sky uh, removes the awareness, uh, ability to perceive the stars as an example that uh, you know, surround uh, the earth as we're uh, you know, rotating on our axis and revolving around the sun, right? Uh, but they're all there. The telescopes are not going out into space. They are simply magnifying, amplifying for us what is otherwise imperceptible because of the limitations of our senses. And as a Frater or Soror noted, uh, at this very moment, there were, you know, kind of trillions of neutrinos uh, going through our bodies at this very second uh, and going through the earth 
and they're going through kind of every centimeter of our bodies at you know, this enormous volume, uh, and, but they're imperceptible to us. So, but our Rosicrucian ontology says everything is kind of a manifestation of spirit energy. Uh, spirit energy pervades all that uh, is, all that uh, kind of is part of the uh, material expression. And I say material meaning as compared to the, uh, the material is not maybe the best word here, but you know, there's the non, that which is the, uh, you know, in a state of non-existence, uh, at least uh, as we might say, uh, you know, uh, scientists might say before the Big Bang, but everything that from a materialist scientific point of view, let's say that you know, came after the Big Bang is, is this spirit energy. And now I say they call it the quantum field, uh, at least one uh, thing that uh, surely uh, has a, a resonance with the ideas of that uh, Rosicrucian teachings have introduced uh, us to and, and humanity for some period of time. Uh, so our consciousness uh, kind of gives shape and form to our particular reality from this infinite sea of vibratory energy. All right. And that's really where it says mind assigns a dimension. All right. There's a ton of uh, imperceptible aspects of reality, what our actuality or the vibratory nature of the cosmos and the cosmic that are imperceptible to us are little nice little finite senses, uh, particularly ones that focus on what we would call the material world, uh, define what we believe and understand to be reality. But it is not a universal reality. It's not a reality shared by all and uh, even the difference of physical creatures. So actuality is just vibrations. Uh, the apparent differences we learn between things is due to the differences in their rate of vibration. And that really comes down to basic scientists uh, uh, or basic science, the difference if recognizing that even to a materialist scientist looking at current ideas in this uh, domain, you know, all the matter is comprised of basic elements. And I don't mean the chemical elements, but uh, you know, neutrons, protons, quarks, uh, electrons, positrons, so basic particles is the particle theory. Uh, and it's just mixing these basic particles produces you know, the billions of different things that we see as manifested reality, the different mixing of them. So they vibrate at different frequencies, these molecules and these atoms. And, and we know when we talk about atomic clocks, or even if you have a uh, kind of a uh, you know, watch on your arm that doesn't require uh, mechanical winding in some fashion, uh, that's going to be electric, electronic, Right, it's based on the vibration rate of a quartz crystal, crystal typically. So reality takes place in our mind and is shaped by our mind. Uh, and it's not uh, our perception of it. It's surely not the absolute of what it is. Now, uh, when I, I first I kind of gave this presentation at a, uh, an event in New York City about a year ago, uh, a young man, young Frata, came up to me afterwards and uh, said to me, you really should read uh, some of the works of a guy named Walter Russell. And so I, I went in, uh, began to do that, and uh, it was very good advice uh, that I received uh, from this Frater. And I'm going to quote something from one of Walter Russell's uh, works. And this particular uh, book is called The Universal One. And there are just two brief power, two brief quotations I'd like to, to share from them that relates to this topic. It says, humans differentiate between the spiritual and the physical universes simply because one universe responds to his senses and the other does not. So I'll just repeat that. Humans differentiate between the spiritual and the physical universes simply because one, the physical universe, 
responds to our senses and the other does not, right? It's all, it's all vibration, right? It is just that our senses, these very limited finite senses, no matter how grand we, I think, think about them from our human experience, because they make up the totality of, of what, generally speaking, most people are aware of. Uh, and they present to such a wide array of the, of the kind of cosmic creation, we think, um, wow, this is amazing. Uh, of course, we have built the apparatus to allow us to extend uh, the range of those senses, right? Telescopes to extend our visual, optical uh, uh, faculties, uh, microphones and amplifiers and speakers to extend, you know, our hearing. Uh, so, but nevertheless, uh, these very limited senses at the end of the day uh, are what make us differentiate between different parts of the cosmic existence and the cosmic vibratory kind of range. And we say this is spiritual and this is physical. And, and this gentleman, Walter Russell, continued to say, quote, when the range of humankind's senses include the entire range of light, he will then know that there is no difference between the spiritual and, the, and physical, except variance in motion, which variance does not constitute a difference in substance. So I'll just repeat that one as well. So when the range of humankind's senses include the entire range of light, by the way, what's very interesting, if you look at physicists, generally they look at the kind of the electromagnetic spectrum really as light. There's X-ray light, there's you know, infrared light, uh, there's a, as we'll refer to in a moment, there's a tiny bit of this quote-unquote light that human beings can ordinarily perceive. So, and this very much relates, I mean, it's kind of ironic because when we ourselves and as Rosicrucians and others who kind of follow similar paths, uh, we so often refer to the spiritual underlying essence as light or a representation of it, we, we use light to represent it. But anyway, he said, again, in the range of humankind's senses include the entire range of light. Humankind will then know that there is no difference between the spiritual and physical, except variance in motion, or you could say vibration, which variance does not con constitute a difference in substance. Right, so we say it's all spirit energy, different rates of vibration make for these different manifestations. Right, so we call this spiritual and you know, something else, the material or physical, and or people call something supernatural simply because the range of our physical senses does not extend to it, and therefore we, we kind of brand it with a different category. So I think what you could perceive from this, and by the way, I want to take us back for a moment or two to our eight tree degree monographs when we talk about even the senses, right? That there, there are no absolutes to our senses. Right? Uh, our vision, each one of us sees something, recognizes something different than another. We don't really have a way of knowing that what you call orange is the exact same experience of what I call orange. We just know that a certain frequency of electromagnetic radiation, that frequency elicits a certain response in us, and we have individually been advised to label that orange. Uh, though really orange may be redder to you than it is to me. Those of us who are, I'm gonna say nearsighted particularly and, and discovered as children perhaps that we needed glasses to see the world, uh, I'm gonna say quote unquote more clearly. Right? Uh, I think most of us who had that experience when we first put on a pair of glasses as children, we were shocked 
that hold it, this is the way the world looks. Now, it, you know, of course, it looks different to, to me than it did before, but it looks different to an eagle than it looks to you and me also, right? Eagle has telescopic vision, right? So, you know, which, what is the reality? Which way is it really? But no two of us share the same reality. So our senses give us access to a tiny portion of the vibrational frequencies of what Rosicrucians traditionally have called the cosmic keyboard of vibrations. And those of us who've been in the order for a while like to remember back in the day, I, I don't recall seeing it more recently, but uh, you know, don't, don't go by me. Uh, but we used to get this printed thing and it would stretch out to be likely about 36 inches wide, um, you know, uh, and it listed the different rates of vibration. And, and uh, I'm going to ask Sir Karen to bring up onto uh, slide number two, uh, just to share that with everyone. And we can talk about this for a moment because it kind of gets at the, let me I'll do it like this for a moment. So if you kind of look at this, uh, we see down at the very bottom of it, we got from what looks to be the kind of you know, dark violet all the way on the left and to on the right hand side, uh, this, this red. And we see the things in between. And it might remind us of Isaac uh, Newton's uh, prism uh, and scattering of, of kind of, you know, the sun's light. Uh, basically what it's showing, you likely have seen this someplace else. Uh, so at the bottom of this slide, it kind of shows the electromagnetic spectrum as it relates to visible light. But just above it in this illustration is it shows you that this little bit of what we look at as light is just a tiny, tiny, tiny piece of the entirety of the electromagnetic spectrum. So we're, uh, we may think that we're perceiving uh, everything that there is through our senses, the reality is if you kind of go out from the radio waves, which in my illustration is on the right, but it really is just saying that they were of, of kind of longer wavelength uh, and, and therefore, uh, you know, shorter, uh, longer frequency, uh, lower frequency, longer wavelength, but lower frequency in terms of vibrations. Uh, then you've got microwaves, which you likely, maybe like me, I heated up my breakfast this morning uh, using a microwave. I get those veggie sausages. And uh, then we go from the microwave uh, and then heading into the infrared. Uh, and that's, uh, you know, in this case, going left on this illustration uh, and then going out toward the ultraviolet, right? With visible light kind of right, this little tiny piece in, in between. Uh, and then you have x-rays and gamma rays, uh, uh, among other things. Uh, so we're seeing and perceiving a tiny bit of this spectrum of the electromagnetic spectrum, which doesn't necessarily include all reality. And in fact, one of the questions you can go kind of Google it and say, gee, to scientists, well, is there an upper limit? Well, the upper limit is, well, what machinery do we have apparatus we have to be able to recognize uh, vibrations at higher levels? Uh, and that's limited by obviously the nature of our equipment. And is what you find is you go into x-rays and gamma rays, there's even more energetic. And, and if you imagine that things like thought uh, are even further out, right? Uh, because thought we know has a creative power, uh, but our normal five senses really, the, the really point I'm trying to illustrate here, and I'll, I'll kind of just shift back, uh, is that we perceive a, a tiny bit uh, of the entirety. Uh, so, and, and, and Karen, you can take that slide down. So our senses though, are the architects of our reality. Right, so just get this, our senses are the architect of our reality. They create the reality we experience by picking out and interpreting selective vibrations to bring to our awareness to form our reality. And basically our senses are sight, hearing, touch, smell, and taste conventionally, right? So, likely 99% of human beings uh, and 99% of the time when they're awake, that's 
the reality that they perceive is through these five physical senses. And to us, that is the world. Uh, what's interesting about this, though, is that uh, they themselves don't give us an absolute truth. They are simply taking and making certain vibrations perceptible to us, but then our own brains and the physical apparatus related to our brains, whether it be our eyeballs and retina and uh, you know, nervous systems, interpret these vibrations further, right? So our senses kind of say, okay, you're gonna have access to these vibrations. And then our, our, uh, our mind, uh, based on the physical apparatus typically, then further interprets these vibrations. Uh, and these are not absolutes. I mean, we're likely all familiar with examples of optical illusions, right? And the lots of them, you go up on YouTube and Google optical illusions, you just find tons of them uh, that uh, show you that even though our senses perceive a certain bandwidth of electromagnetic vibrations or the vibrations of spirit, but they don't give us some absolute truth to them because this apparatus, our mind, our brains and the physical apparatus also relate to the translation of those things. Uh, so we know hot to one person can feel like it's cool to another. Right? Uh, I mean, that can happen in, and actually put a stress on marriages. Some person says, oh man, it's too hot. I say, no, no, I'm cool. Right. Same temperature in the room, right? The temperatures are the absolute, right? Your individual perception of it that is hot or cool uh, was quite fascinating in a sense is that uh, you can go in and pick up a piece of metal, touch something that's metallic in the room you're seated in, and then touch perhaps a piece of cloth. The metallic item will seem colder than the piece of cloth. But if you go and take a device that measures temperature uh, using infrared, you know, they're, you know, these things now are quite common in airports as an example, but you can buy simple devices that will measure the temperature of the, both the piece of metal, your refrigerator door perhaps, uh, as well as that piece of cloth. And you will find if they're in the same room, they have the same temperature. But to us, one will feel cooler than the other. And the reason being is that we perceive the temperature not so much in absolute terms, but in how fast it removes heat from our bodies or transfers heat from one object to another, in this case, our body, our hand, to itself. And things that transfer heat rapidly, we call cool. We will refer to them as being cool or colder than that which doesn't transfer a piece of wood or a piece of cloth uh, that does, doesn't transfer heat as rapidly. A very interesting little science experiment one can do, uh, and it gives you a kind of counterintuitive result, is take an ice cube, all right, uh, place it on a, a wood item in the same room as a metallic item, side by side. Place one ice cube on one and one on the other. Somewhat counterintuitively, while the, the, the metallic item feels cooler, the ice cube will actually melt faster. Reason being is that that metal will extract the heat out of the ice cube, even though it doesn't seem like a lot of heat to us, but there's relative heat in there, out of the ice cube more rapidly than the piece of wood would. And therefore, uh, we find something like that feels cooler to us, even though it has the same absolute temperature as the piece of wood. So uh, these are our, our, our minds uh, which relate to our brains and physical apparatus uh, influence what we perceive uh, and, and help form our world. There are examples in taste similarly, which I'll, I'll touch on in a minute. Uh, some of you may remember about three or four years ago, there was uh, an internet uh, item going around and it made the news, uh, you know, the regular traditional media that there was a picture of a dress that to some people appeared to be blue and black and others the same photo the dress appeared to be gold and white i'd like to say go figure 
right? Same picture, same picture to some blue and black, to others gold and white. Same vibrations in terms of light being re uh, reflected from that picture to the person standing beside them whose experience is blue and black as compared to the person whose experience is gold and white. They're both being stri struck by the same light. Uh, there's no difference or distinction there. So uh, what really we see there is again, mind assigns a dimension, right? Their vibrations, our apparatus is what creates the reality. There's something called synthesthesia or synthesthesia, which really is, uh, and there are individuals that are synthesthetes uh, who get multiple sensory reactions to the thing that most of us would simply get a sense reaction only in one sense. So a synthesthete might get a reaction to sound, a tone that's also con consistently also produces a color uh, in their minds, right? Consistently produces a color, even though it's a sound. Actually, there's some synthesthetes that get a taste reaction to certain words. So they will find certain words to be, ooh, that taste terrible, quite literally. Uh, so vibrations, yes, coming uh, at the, the individual, but it's our mind, brain, other sensory apparatus that create the reality. I'll give you an example here. Oh, I'm just kind of, let me just see how badly I messed things up here. No, okay, we're back, sorry. Uh, struck the keyboard a little too vigorously. Uh, there was an interesting article in the New York Times about a year or so ago uh, that illustrated uh, this uh, kind of an everyday life. And they said the, the scent called the lily of the valley uh, is a very popular one, I guess, to use in perfumes and so on, but it cannot be easily bottled. And they said for, for decades, companies that made soap, lotions, and perfumes have relied on a chemical called Borgenal to imbue their products with the sweet smell of the little white flowers. And they say a tiny drop can be extraordinarily intense of this particular chemical. But it, if you can smell it at all, that is, for some people, a small percentage of people, they cannot smell anything. It, no smell registers uh, when they're exposed to it. So for some it's very intense, but for others, no smell at all. They say similarly, the earthly compound to Ethylfencol, ethylfencol, which is present in beets, is so powerful for some people that a small chunk of the root vegetable smells like a, a heap of dirt. For others, that same compound is as undetectable as the scent of bottled water. Uh, hitting closer to home for me personally, uh, there's a small percentage of the population that has a sense reaction, a taste reaction to a chemical that is found in Brussels sprouts. And if you have this taste response, you dislike Brussels sprouts intensely because they are repulsive in taste. So no matter how many different ways I've had people prepare them and say, just try these, don't worry, mine are different. It's abhorrent, the taste. Uh, so other people don't have a taste reaction to this particular chemical. There's a small percentage of the population who do, and if you do, you do not like Brussels sprouts, as an example. Here's a really interesting example also about these things about the uh, odors. Uh, they said, a scientist uh, are able actually to flip people's perceptions of odors. So as a scientist who uh, spends a lot of time working in this area on smell, uh, and she said that she's done experiments presenting people with a chemical combination and telling them that is vomit. She then presented the same chemical combination to the people, unknowingly to them, and told them it was Parmesan cheese. So the participants refused to believe that the samples were the same. As one they found so clearly disgusting and the other was so clearly delicious. So that's called sensory expectation, All right? So we can, kind of heighten somebody's expectation about what they're going to experience and it will influence what they perceive. So people have, as they say, different smellscapes uh, is what they kind of now say, uh, kind of uh, 
you know, in the scientific community regarding this uh, thing. So we all smell things a little bit differently, as an example. So I'm gonna give you another interesting point here. And this is again, mine assigning a dimension that, you know, and it's back to, that is just vibration. It's just vibration. Things aren't as we think they are, it's just vibration. So things don't have a color. Everything is just energy. Things do not have a color. Right. The reality is what we call the color of an object is due to the light energy that it reflects back to us. Not the, the, not the intrinsic nature of the object. So an object's color is due to the light energy that the atoms making up the object don't absorb and which are reflected back to our eyes. So in many ways, the color of an object is actually the color it doesn't have at all because it simply reflects that energy back, that frequency of energy. So <coughs> uh, if you look at visible light, visible, visible light is vibrations in the rain ranges from 400 trillion cycles per second. So if you look at kind of red, which is you know, slower frequency, 400 trillion cycles per second to kind of the violet, near ultraviolet, 750 trillion cycles per second. So an object that absorb all light, that all of that light energy at any of those kind of frequencies, we call black. So if it's capable of absorbing all of the light energy at those frequencies, we call it black. If it reflects back all of those, uh, all of the energy at those frequencies, we call it white. If it absorbs part and reflects back the other part, the part that reflects back is the part of the spectrum that therefore we, that it reflects back, we therefore designate the object as green or red or blue. But the object itself doesn't have any color. It is simply what energy wavelengths does it absorb and which does it reflect back. And again, if it absorbs them all, we say it's black. It reflects it all back, we call it white, et cetera. Now what's kind of interesting is that human vision uh, has simply three color buckets what we call RGB typically, red, green, and blue, right? So if you go and you know, look at a computer monitor or you're buying your TV, generally it's about RGB. You've got the little cables when you're connecting things, RGB, red, green, and blue, because human vision has three color buckets. There are many creatures that have two color buckets and there's some who have four and five and actually there's a type of shrimp that has a dozen color buckets. You figure, waste it on a shrimp, perhaps. But anyway, so when you have uh, everything basically is very crude uh, in this kind of red, uh, green, and blue, right? We only have, it's like having that you could only taste certain things, like say in taste, right? We have what is basically said to be five to six uh, taste sensations, sweet, sour, uh, salty, bitter, uh, I think umami or umani, you know, I'm not even trying to go there, but you hopefully know what I'm talking about there for people, you know, like thinking Japanese food, it's, it's kind of accentuated. So we have these things, but imagine that you couldn't taste sweetness, right? And, and take the coronavirus, unfortunately, one of the symptoms of it, right, happens to be that you lose your sense of taste. Well, uh, I don't know if the, all the senses of taste come back at the same time, but you could imagine where you perhaps couldn't taste a saltiness or, or sweetness, et cetera. Uh, well, we have generally four to five buckets, uh, and but when it comes to sight, we just have three color buckets, red, green, and blue. So uh, certain other frequencies uh, we are oblivious, oblivious to, though, uh, they can be detected and visualized by scientific instruments. So now we do hear regularly, right, that we know honeybees uh, can perceive the ultraviolet more so than humans. And if you go and Google this and, and look at the difference of how a honeybee would perceive a flower versus an ordinary human's vision, you see a radically different appearance to the flower. Uh, so, but something that is quite fascinating is science has uh, found ways uh, to in, in, basically increase the, our, uh, the availability of the information 
that the color of an object can, can convey to us. Now we know we can tell something sometimes about the color of an object uh, conveying to us information. Uh, like when we see something that is heated to a very high degree and it begins to radiate uh, light in the visible red frequency for us. And we know that's very, very hot because it's red. It's red hot. But there is a tremendous amount of information being given off that our own visual apparatus is not sensitive enough to perceive. And uh, it now is where science has found ways to basically pull apart the red, green, and blue into finer and finer things, uh, all within the same bandwidth that particularly being used now in areas of health and agriculture. Uh, and this is called hyperspectral imaging. And I'm gonna uh, ask Karen to put up slide number three uh, on the screen. And this is an example, uh, I hope everyone can see this, of hyperspectral imaging, right? So if you had like those 12 buckets, like the shrimp, uh, this is what you'd see. And what you're seeing here is an aerial photograph of uh, you know, agricultural site, farming fields. And what it's revealing are, is the different kind of, a bunch of other information. You know, we can see in a very crude way that perhaps looking at the right-hand part of the slide, let's say the greenish, kind of traditional greenish looking one, it's on right or mine, but it may be left on yours. Uh, you can see things that are browner versus greener. And we know, okay, browner likely means drier. Right, greener likely means uh, you know uh, more moist uh, and, and having more water content, right? But believe it or not, this uh, what you see on the other side of the picture, where you see the kind of magenta and purple and yellow, etc. Uh, uh, it is actually one same field. It's just a continuation of the same field because you can notice on the lower right. I'm saying lower right on my screen, uh, there's a road. Uh, when you look at the multicolored uh, part of the image, that road continues across the same field uh, heading up to the you know, upper right hand side of the slide. Uh, so uh, what you are able to discern or what the agriculturalists and other uh, agronomists and others are able to observe is looking at the, the, the relative health of the crops growing on those fields because they actually are reflecting light at different frequencies based on their health. So whether they're being attacked by parasites, whether there's a lot of weeds present, whether they're a little drier than they should be, whether the chemical balance in the, in the crop is where you want it to be or not. Uh, so this information is available. Uh, it is just that our eyes don't allow us to see this aspect of the world, right? So yes, if we had the 12 buckets that a shrimp has, basically where they can chop the same visible wavelengths of light into 12 buckets rather than three, we'd be able to see this. Now the problem with the shrimp is they have a very small brain. So they actually don't respond to it, all of it as, as we could. So again, uh, mind assigned a dimension uh, uh, a wonderful question someone brought up uh, uh, about whether painters, particularly impressionists, were, were they seeing more? Because actually there are some people they call, uh, so normally humans are what they call trichromats, right? Uh, there are people who are quad chromats and uh, what's quite interesting, and then this is where the point that people brought about artists, uh, for quad chromats, matching their clothing can be much more challenging than it is for those of us who are trichromats because they see more distinctions and see more conflict between the color matching. So they may go, oh, that doesn't go with it. For us, they go, oh, that looks like it goes fine. Uh, and as uh, some folks have noted, uh, people who are artists see in a broader spectrum more, and that may perhaps be what leads them to be artists, right? They're seeing things that we're not seeing and then they're acting on them and we go, wow, that's amazing. Right, well, it's because they see things differently than we do. Uh, it's not simply because they were geniuses, they've got different information coming in and they use the information and we go, wow, that's amazing. Uh, so anyway, uh, let me pause for a, a couple of moments here and see if uh, uh, there's any comments or questions that would be worth 
uh, at this moment responding to. We can get to some at the end as well, but I just want to do that before kind of moving on a little bit. And I'm asking Karen uh, to be my uh, help here. Uh, All right, Julian. Um, there was a couple that I just took photos of the chat so I wouldn't lose them. Um, uh, one is, does ultimate reality need to be a shared experience and understanding by all? You probably covered that one. Well, you know, I, I will give you a, a point of view. I, I would say that likely is uh, perhaps when one attains the absolute level of consciousness of the cosmic, right? Uh, where uh, it is in that total oneness, but everything else would seem to show uh, that uh, our own evolution simply exposes to more and more of this reality. And we all kind of come at it a little differently. Uh, the cosmic consciousness clearly embodies it all. Uh, but I think all the manifestations, which we are part of, we are these extensions of this cosmic consciousness. And clearly we're, we're, we're part of the cosmic consciousness, right? We're aware, we're part of being, et cetera. But our perception is finite. Right? We don't perceive what the shrimp does or the, or the flower does or the tree does or our neighbor does. Uh, not to mention, let's say, individuals who could perceive or, or, or consciousnesses that could perceive more of that electromagnetic spectrum where we pointed out visible light is just a tiny piece, right? Let's say, you know, generally speaking, we consider these to be superhuman capabilities. Uh, so if, you know, it's the old comic book stuff. Uh, some of us uh, likely did uh, send off for x-ray glasses that were advertised in the back of comic books way back in the day. Uh, and, you know, you could see if you were, if one had the capacity to respond uh, and perceive x-ray radiation, right, we'd be, able, things that right now will opaque to us, we'd be able to see through them and be able to say, oh, wow, you've got this I see on your lung, or you've got this hair, right? You wouldn't have to go to the doctor for someone to be able to point it out to you. So, you know, I think the question that, that has been posed there is dealing with an absolute reality that is likely so uh, uh, beyond, uh, I would say, our, our present ability to uh, contemplate, appreciate, and therefore to opine on, uh, you know, sorry, just my iPad took a, a, a fall there. But so, uh, yeah, I guess when we all come back to the whole and we're all like one, just one with the whole, we'll all have the same experience, but they'll still be part of the cosmic that's evolving, you know, uh, we know there are higher levels of consciousness that, that elements of the cosmic kind of uh, manifest, uh, whether you call them ascended masters or things beyond those even that, that you know. Uh, so, but the likelihood is there'll still be other aspects of the cosmic continuing to evolve, uh, you know, whether it be, you know, the, the mineral and plant life uh, that is still evolving uh, and doesn't have necessarily the same levels of perception that human beings do in reflection. Uh, so that's kind of my thoughts on it, but uh, you, may, you may meditate on it and come up with, you know, bang, sort of. So uh, if you do, uh, please share it with us or, you know, write a discourse, uh, you know, uh, what, uh, or a paragraph or just share it with people on, on the Wiskers community. Karen, should I move on or are we? Uh, the, would you like another question? Uh, if if I'm, I'm asking you, you're the producer. There is, there are more. Um, is spiritual energy just somewhere on the non-visible band of the light spectrum? That's part of the question. Isn't that just the concept of refraction due to fiber optic principles? Well, we could just say that, I mean, I think from point of view, we just say that uh, consciousness and soul are just extremely high rates of vibration. If you just even look at a visible light again, and if you, if you go out to x-rays and gamma rays, the, the rate of vibrations of these things are like, it's like, you know, two times 10 to the 24th power, right? I mean, uh, so is soul and conscious are viewed as beyond those in terms of the rates of vibration. So I don't know if that uh, answers that, but you know, the visible spectrum and, and things do, uh, diffract, right? I mean, you can, uh, we know 
uh, radio waves are diffracted somewhat uh, by the atmosphere, right? So therefore you have trouble getting a signal or, or you can pick up Tokyo from your bedroom because you know, the atmosphere was bouncing those, those radio waves around. Uh, clearly as you get up to higher degrees of vibration or higher frequencies, these things penetrate everything, right? So things that are going at like gamma rays and cosmic rays, uh, they're not as likely to be thwarted. Some of those things uh, are, are kind of our atmosphere protects us from, but so uh, I, I don't know, you know, when you look at things like thought and consciousness, whether one uh, would say that they get uh, diffracted or not, perhaps, uh, you know, there's a way of thinking about that and, and can, can observe that they do, but uh, I, I, uh, they surely are not down in the bands where light is, light is actually fairly slow in terms of frequencies as compared to X-rays and gamma rays. So Karen, how about what I'll do is I'll, I will go on to another couple of slides uh, just so that uh, I make my way through them. Uh, so, I mean, the net, I guess, kind of is this matter isn't what it appears to be. I want to illustrate this a little further. And this is, again, just going back to our slide of uh, let's Maybe we put uh, slide number one back up of, you know, cosmic human of sorts. So this is going to be a, a question here. Uh, so what we perceive as solid matter is uh, what percent actually simply space? Anybody want to throw a number up? We can throw it in the chat. Okay, I'm going to pick up from the one coming from Linda. Uh, and uh, Linda, you were very, very, very close. Uh, the actual percentage is 99.999996% space. But that was close enough. Uh, so uh, kind of pretty wild when you think about it. So what we call solid matter is 99.999996% space. Uh -huh. So we call it solid. We think it's opaque, right? But it's mainly space. What's going on there, right? Uh, our bodies, what percentage do you think our bodies are space, made up of space? Maybe I want to throw into the chat there. Well, I'm going to give you the answer. Actually, it's the same number, 99.999996% <laughs> space. Well, th what makes up the other 0. 0.00004 right, are the actual protons, neutrons, electrons, right? They, you know, they have some mass, right? So they make up the rest. Somebody asked, well, why not 100%? Because the, the atoms, the, 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 the particles that, as science who kind of, you know, you know hanging out on the particle side of things, to say, okay, they make up that mass. We know there is a, there, you can demonstrate mass. Obviously, Einstein and, you know, nuclear bombs demonstrate that mass and energy are interchangeable. So we're made up of energy, and some of that energy is in the form of mass, but it's 0.000004% of our bodies and of, of the material things that we, we encounter in everyday life. So actually our bodies are made up of seven times 10 to the 27 number power, number of atoms. So basically 70 with 26 zeros after is how many atoms are in the human body. Uh, and that's equal to 7 billion billion billions. That's a lot of atoms. You could stay up a long time counting them. Uh, but Despite that, we're still 99.999996% space. So uh, now here's a, something just, uh, again, this is mind assigned dimension, our perception of what is versus what really is or actual, right? Uh, so I uh, posed a question to scientists at one of the national laboratories uh, was that uh, if you looked at the energy in a 150 pound person, right? And you, you release that energy, and, and what would it be equivalent to in, as compared to the hydrogen bomb dropped on Hiroshima during World War II? 150 pound person, if you release the energy there compared to the atomic bomb detonated at Hiroshima. Uh, anyone want to do a guess on the answer? We'll take it in the chat. Okay, no one running to do that answer. The answer is 
117,000 117, times the energy that was released in that uh, atomic detonation over Hiroshima. 117,000 times. That's the energy that's in a 150 pound person. And they basically simply did the calculations, uh, which they shared with me. E equals MC squared. They said energy equals matter. And they said 150, they turned it into kilograms and said, oh, it's about, you know, 70 some kilograms times, uh, you know, uh, uh, the speed of light squared. And uh, it was a very simple answer for them to produce. So when you go around and you meet people and say, gee, I'm so tired, I have no energy. Clearly, they're confused and we're confused, right? We have so much energy, we have not a clue, right? We have no idea of who and what we are. We're just totally oblivious. Uh, you know, and that's just the material side of ourselves, right? You know, let's, you know don't even get into uh, the other aspect of ourselves, right? Uh, so why do, we, why, why do things appear solid? Uh, is because uh, our eyes are not sensitive uh, enough to perceive uh, these spaces between these things. It's very much like when you're looking at a, a you know, a, your TV screen, uh, that the images seem complete. But when you go walk up really, 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 really close to the TV screen, right, you can see the individual pixels. And the more pixels, the finer the image, right? And there's a certain point, uh, like way before you get to the size of, uh, uh, of atoms, uh, that where our eyes no longer uh, are responsive. So our eyes are actually responsive to only certain frequencies and, and those like the wavelength of light is much too big to, to go between atoms to show you therefore the space between them by like so many orders of magnitude. So, uh, and, and here's a related question by the way, is why do things feel solid if they're mainly space? And, and believe it or not, you never touch anything. What you're feeling when you feel like you're the pressure of something is really the repulsive force of the electrons coming near one another. It would take an incredible amount of force for you actually to make those atoms touch, right? More touch than you, more force than human beings can exert. So that, that force, that repulsive force is so great. But to us, we feel it, we sense it, just like you can feel a magnetic force, right? When you, move two magnets together, but you feel, oh, I feel this force. Uh, that is happening, but on a micro, 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 you know, kind of level. So uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit more. This is we'll, we'll kind of just uh, a little bit more thought on the idea of, of light waves. So you know, let's keep in mind that sight, and this is really getting us back to one of the earliest points, uh, the, the first slide of the, of the that, or first set of points I, I mentioned, right? That all of this takes place in our heads, right? Everything we see, everything that we quote unquote smell, everything that we taste is only in our head. When I mean by our head, I mean in our consciousness, right? It's all in our consciousness. There is no reality outside of our consciousness. So even if you look at sight, and, and sight is a good illustration of this, right? Uh, as it used to be pointed out in the Rose Christian monograph, say there's nobody looking out through your eyeball. There's nobody going kind of like, oh, let me see out of here, you know? Uh, there's nobody there. <clears throat> What's happening, right, is our eyes are kind of like cameras, right? Light waves are coming in, <clears throat> going through the lens, creating very tiny images on the, our retina upside down, uh, two different images on the retina, uh, on each retina, a different image on each retina, I should say. <clears throat> Uh, the, that energy, the photons, excite uh, the certain types of cells, rods and cones, as they're called, uh, on the back of the retina. We have about 120 million rods and about six or seven million cones. The cones give us the color vision. They, when they're excited, they send an electrical signal along the optic nerve, to, which goes to the visual processing center in our brain. And somehow, miraculously, boom, we get a picture of something upside up in three dimensions, and it's not tiny. Right, it's you know this full blown thing, and it appears to be outside of ourselves, but it's just an image in our, in our consciousness. So it's one thing is recognized. This is why space has no absolute reality. It's just a realization in our consciousness. Right, all of these things are just in, the only absolute is consciousness or being. 
That's the only absolute truth is being. So everything else is taking place in our head. Uh, so, you know, even when we're projecting out, right, out of our bodies, you know, out of body projection, it's really just an experience of consciousness, right? So instead of our conscious being like, oh, I'm here, you know, here, it's, it's, it's like, oh, I'm over here. But it's just an idea in consciousness. Uh, you know, same thing when we uh, look at smell, taste, and touch, right? These are all just uh, things that basically we're experiencing in our consciousness. It was kind of interesting. Uh, we've talked a lot about the five physical senses and how they kind of given rise to our world based on their limited on their limitations, right? Uh, but other living creatures uh, respond to other rates of vibration uh, very often in addition to the ones that we respond to. So uh, we know that many animals respond to magnetic fields, right? Uh, homing pigeons. Uh, among others, but lots of animals actually uh, do respond to magnetic fields. So that exists around us. Why can't we perceive it? Well, what's very interesting, by the way, is that uh, scientists have taken people and put them uh, in you know, a shielded chamber, uh, and they'll put, they surround them in kind of a metal cage. They put uh, kind of uh, brainwave monitoring devices. And what they'll do is they blindfold them, block their sense of hearing and, and sight. And they then, using these coils around their bodies that, you know, that they're surrounded by in this kind of cage, they, alter, they, they, they move the magnetic field, change it from the Earth's kind of natural field and alter it, right? And what they do find is the brain actually responds, even though there's not a human perception of it, the person doesn't perceive it, but the brain is actually responding to the change in the magnetic field. So some would say we've likely lost our capabilities around this. When I say lost, they're not, doesn't mean you can't find them, right? But they're not uh, avail readily available to us. And so if we look at our ancestors and you look at, uh, and actually they've done some tests with people who live more in kind of forested areas and so on, uh, who have a better perception of the magnetic field of the earth. So some other scientists have looked at this from a very different dimension or, or angle, is that in some cases where people will uh, be at a place like Sedona or Arizona or some other place and say, oh, wow, this place has a very special feel to it. It's actually them responding to uh, an abnormality in the magnetic field of the earth in that place. And that can be caused by crystal formations in the rocks and crystals under pressure. The rocks will put them under pressure, will generate an electric charge, electric charge will generate a magnetic field. And we walk into it and go, wow. Uh, so uh, other creatures, as we know, have the sensitivity. We've kind of uh, lost basic use of it. Uh, dogs, uh, for instance, can hear much higher frequencies than humans. Uh, elephants can hear much lower frequencies than humans, right? So uh, you know, other animals have a, a, a bigger range of this. Uh, think of the sense of smell of, of dogs, and this actually even cats also, but look at the sense of smell, multiple times greater than our own. So they can perceive things through using that sense that allow them to experience the world in a more uh, complex way uh, than we are able to experience. Uh, what's quite interesting, they've done some studies, this is really different, uh, looking at cats, that apparently cats, uh, they've done these studies in nursing homes where people are in, in hospice kind of situations, that cats seem to be very aware when a person is near transition. There's something perhaps that's different perhaps in you know, the, uh, what we're exhaling or our bodies are exuding kind of, but that cats will, uh, be drawn to for a period of time with someone before they're about to approach transition. So clearly there's some other information that we as humans don't perceive uh, in the ordinary course of our perceptions that uh, other animals, in this case cats, can. Uh, I see actually, you know, they've got dogs that they've trained to do cancer detection because again, it is one of these things that apparently uh, changes some part of our biochemistry in a way that with the very heightened sense of smell that dogs have that they're able to perceive it, right? So it exists in the world, we're not cognizant of it. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, eagles have telescoping vision. 
Uh, we looked at photoreceptors and others, and we know that actually uh, a number of uh, animals have uh, infrared, per perceive the infrared. Uh, and one animal that we're all kind of uh, need to think we need to be attentive of is that snakes. Right, so snakes have a sensor that picks up the infrared, which allows them to identify prey in the dark. And I think we are all kind of like, hey, we don't want to be the prey in the dark uh, where uh, a snake is able to perceive this. So, you know, it all leads us back to remembering that mind uh, assigned uh, this, you know, assigned the world that we perceive comes through this. Uh, vampire bats also, by the way, pick up on the infrared. So let's think for a little bit as we're uh, recognizing that we as Rosicrucians though acknowledge or, or, or would propose that humans have more than the five physical sensors, right? So this notion of a sixth sense and a seventh sense and things of this nature and capabilities uh, for Rosicrucians uh, are, are taken as true. And then we look to develop these things. And, and so the notion of a sixth sense of being able to communicate via telepathy, all right? We've, uh, likely we all had some demonstration of this in our lives, either whether, you know, in an organized fashion or just happened, right? Uh, we look at the notion of psychometry, which is where uh, by holding an object in one's hand, uh, that one can pick up information about uh, the ownership and previous conditions related to that object, right? So clearly using a different kind of sense than our five physical senses. If we look at the idea of seeing auras, right? And, and you know, this comes up in the resolution monographs where you can develop uh, your capability of seeing auras. Uh, and as is pointed out in our resolution studies is you're not seeing it simply with your eyes in an optical way, what it is, is that there are vibrations being radiated by all of us and all living things that we do have the sensory ability to perceive <clears throat> And we typically, it, translate as a, it translates as a visual image for most of us in the sense of light and quote unquote auras. But it doesn't mean that someone who is, is blind is not able to perceive those things, same things, but they may have a different realization of them. Our realization is one of colors, uh, uh, where really we're picking up information, from radiation from that person's kind of uh, electromagnetic, you know, vibrations that they're radiating uh, that, uh, we perceive and, and we, we get a visual image of it. And there's things like astral images, obviously. So uh, I want to kind of turn a little bit to you know, some of the last points I wanted to raise in this. Uh, and we're kind of, uh, I guess I'm pretty much on schedule now and I look at it. Okay. So, yes. And this is, so at the very beginning, right, it said that you know, the mind. Uh, is a both a passive and an active kind of uh, creator of our reality, right? So the passive part, the mind takes in sensory information, translates it for us. So our, so our organs are taking the sensory information, right? You know, and then our mind is translating that for us. Sometimes it can be fooled, right? Optical illusions, all sorts of other kind of things, sensory expectation. But you know, it basically does a pretty good job, and it tends, if you look at other scientific experiments the mind will tend to try to normalize things. So if something looks a little bit off, the mind actually will kind of make it, you know, will fill in the blank for you. Uh, and in fact, people, you speaking of filling in the blanks, we say, well, the reality, even a motion picture is the mind creating this image in our minds of something being continuous motion, where it's actually just a bunch of, of, of quickly, of static pictures put in rapid fashion in front of us, right? So, the mind is a passive one uh, taking in stuff and processing for us, but, but it also can be a creative of our own reality. And, and I wanted to kind of close by drawing attention to some of these things. So one of those things is visualization, right? Uh, you know, visualization allows us uh, to create our reality, right? So it's not simply that we have to be passive. Visualization is a way <clears throat> of us interacting with this cosmic sea of vibrations and helping to bring about <clears throat> certain manifestations of its, its, in its formation, right? You can do it for little things, you can do it for big things, right? So, uh, and, and this goes back to, to me, the, the label of it or the description of it, I, I find you know, kind of most profound and summarizing it 
the alchemy of illumined thought, right? The mind, basically, which is the soul consciousness, since working through the mind, uh, being able to alter reality, right? And there are lots of ways of doing it, but there's uh, visualization we kind of learn early on the Rose Christian teachings, uh, and it becomes something that we use as an instrument and a device to alter our reality. So if you want to have cosmic attunement, uh, where you have awareness of it, right? And obviously it's by degree, right? All of us, you know, some days are better than other days and et cetera, right? Uh, visualization, pretty reliable way of boom, 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 taking yourself out there uh, and having that type of attunement, right? And, you know, the, I would say this, the, the bigger whatever kind of thing that you, and I don't mean, you know, bigger object, when you're visualizing, but the grand, uh, the more you can embrace. So it's like, if you said, let me go look at some Hubble space photos first, right? And I'm gonna use that to inspire my visualization, right? Uh, you know, the more powerful things you can kind of, you know, attune your consciousness with. Uh, so those things, that's why they're so useful. They so, can be so inspiring, right? We use that or whatever it might be. It can be, you know, a beautiful sunset, whatever you use, right? That to inspire you, then you can use with that uh, to allow us to take your consciousness to these higher levels of awareness that, uh, you know, our five physical senses are not going to, to attune us with. They're like very low grade AM. You need to tune into the FM stuff. And that's the stuff in this higher aspect of our consciousness that we have access to. Another way that we kind of create our own rea reality, but well, this is kind of like really kind of down to earth, is karma, right? Uh, our actions, our words, and our thoughts uh, create karma. And so in that way, we can shape our reality, right? Uh, so that's for real. Uh, and I say as students of Rosicrucianism and mysticism, well, the first thing we kind of work on is our actions usually. Next, we work on our words, but ultimately we have to also work on our thoughts. Because as we also progress as Rosicrucian students or students of mysticism, our thoughts become uh, much more efficacious. And, and you know, you do not want to mess uh, because now you're broadcasting with a lot more wattage in a sense, and you don't want it to be off key because that boom, you know, that's coming back to you. So, you know, you begin to then work on your thoughts, which is like a full time full-time, full-time, full-time job, right? Uh, uh, so, uh, you know, let us also, as we talk about cosmic attunement, you know, work on our cosmic awareness, right? So that uh, we, are, we are living in uh, this cosmic environment, right? Uh, I, you know, for me, and all of us, you know, have different triggers perhaps. I mean, we all have some things in common, but some things that are different, right? Uh, to me, I use the example of when you're out someplace in the country, or wherever that might be, and you see the sky filled with stars at night. And, and when it takes your breath away, that's when you've awakened for a moment, right? You've awakened for a moment, you know, I'd say you could call it lucid waking, right? You've awakened for a moment. Use that awareness at that moment. Try to cultivate that awareness. Don't overstimulate yourself, right? Because you, you know, you can, like with anything else, you want to build up your capabilities, right? Evolution, not revolution, to quote, I think it was H. Benson or Ralph Lewis, leads to lasting change. So you don't want to overstress the system, but you want to, we want to cultivate that cosmic awareness, right? Of remembering while we're walking down the street that we are in this cosmic hole uh, so that we don't get so absorbed in the football game of the Yankees or, hey, the last dance, Michael Jordan, really good show. Uh, but we get so absorbed, you know, that we, we forget because then we're asleep, right? We're just sleepwalking. We're sleepwalking, right? So cultivating cosmic awareness, therefore, we change our reality and there's, you know, uh, there's infinite, uh, beautiful, uh, uh, good things that come from that, right? It's just uh, uh, that attunement that comes from that. Uh, can shape and affect our material reality, the physical reality that we experience uh, enormously, right? Because as they say, as above, so below. Yeah. Uh, keep uh, taking yourself there, but you know, you want to do it uh, uh, gradually. So, you know, we, the, the, the challenge for us is not to have the five physical senses 
control or dictate our reality, right? And so they provide certain information. We spend all our time crunching it, uh, but that will not take us very far. It may take one far, certain parts of material, parts of life, but you're gonna leave that behind, right? No matter how good it gets. So, uh, you know, and the last thing uh, I would say, uh, we want to reflect on light, life, and love, right? So we've got light, which is this manifestation, this awareness. Life gives us the chance to you know, develop our kind of spiritual awareness, and we don't want to waste the opportunity of our lives, right? Uh, don't spend a lot of time where you're not doing the, the work that's long-term, right? And then, you know, to ultimately realize the love that underlies all of this, which you know, can allow us to go through life differently. And the, the richer and fuller that we kind of realize that, uh, the less stressful and more, uh, you know, somebody put it this way, the basic trust, right? Where we, we kind of restore in ourselves more of that basic trust and, and can live our lives uh, that way. So anyway, that leaves us about two minutes and 39 seconds by my count. Uh, let's go back to the Q and A if uh, there's something there. Well, Julian, there's a, there a few questions, mostly what's the difference between uh, reality and actuality, and can we sync these two? Well, so actuality is just a vibration. So if somebody put it, this is a physicist, mind you, I was reading this out not too long ago, said the sun does not emanate heat. The heat is a human perception. The sun emanates energy that, way, that will agitate molecules, right? Because they absorb that energy, right? So they, they vibrate, you know, in a certain way faster than molecules. Not really at the atom level, but the molecules do, right? But that's not heat. Heat is a human perception. It's all just energy. Right, so that's the actuality, right? It's this energy that basically you can do almost all, anything with, all these different things you can do with it. I say our minds can help form it, reshape it, clear the cosmic thought that's brought about. Uh, you think about, I mean, I just look at, you know, the number of kinds of insects. I'm like, Jesus, clearly God creates a very imaginative fella or whatever, or, or not fella, uh, you know, woman, whatever it be. Uh, so reality is what, our minds kind of shape, right? So we have a different reality. There are 8 billion of us, almost 7.8 billion. We all have a different reality, different experience. There's insects have a different reality uh, than, you know, an animal, a cat, your dog is smelling all these things, it's different realities. So the realities of these, you know, transitory things that are very much conditioned by our own past experience, because even your past experience, right? If you like certain things, dislike certain things, you're gonna perceive certain things a certain way. You may ignore certain things, not even recognize them. So that's all the conditioned stuff of taking the actuality, which is just really the vibration uh, of this cosmic consciousness. Would you like another question? Sure. All right. If, Can human thought have an effect on an electromagnetic field so as to help in creation? Oh, yeah. I mean, that's a, I'd say that, that's what visualization is, right? And there's different ways. When I say visualize, you can do vision. Let me go see it, you know, create a house or a car or, or a coat. But it's also when we're trying to help people through uh, absentee healing, we're trying to bring more harmony to the world. Uh, you know, you're trying to bring somebody into harmony, right? Maybe they're a little bit out of harmony at a given moment for some reason. So uh, thoughts, uh, we know basic Rosicrucian thing, thoughts are creative. Now, someone of uh, Rosicrucian story many years ago, I remember hearing her say that, you know, uh, fortunately, she said for, for humans, on the material, on the, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I got cancel that. Oh, crap, sorry, oh my God, uh, sorry. Uh, okay, I don't, hopefully I did that. Uh, on, the, on the material world, fortunately, it takes a good deal to kind of sometimes bring, you know, things into material reality, right? Because our thoughts are such a, a mess, right? Uh, typically as human beings. So upon the, on the higher planes of the spiritual world, uh, they're much more efficacious, right? There's less interference. So you don't want to kind of get up into these more, you know, astral kind of or other kind of planes of consciousness until you've worked out more of the emotional, psychological stuff on yourself and ourselves. And that's what Rosicrucian helps us do. Modernism helps us do. So, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, we're, we're basically taking spirit energy and we're using our consciousness to alter it, form it, uh, do our thoughts, kind of do things with it intentionally, unintentionally as well. So, uh, absolutely. And you can use your, if you look at your aura, quote unquote, right, you can uh, hold certain thoughts, radiate those thoughts into your environment. Now, we do it sometimes in a very kind of global sense, right, but you can do that in your localized environment. Uh, you can do it in your workplace. 
Uh, you can do it with you know other kind of situations. So you were altering the electromagnetic, you know, but it's a high, very high rates of vibration obviously because it affects people on the subconscious level. I mean, it's very reliable. Uh, it, it is, you know, it, it's, it's like talking to them, but more effective, it's more efficient. Uh, Frater, Julian, uh, this has been such an interesting presentation and thank you for coming to our homes to talk to us about all these fascinating subjects. So uh, thank you so much. Well, and thank all of you for uh, joining from, uh, you know, the many places that uh, folks are. It's just so wonderful that technology, you know, one of the things that uh, the good mind uh, creates is limited as it is sometimes because it's been inspired uh, that, you know, we can do this with these tools and uh, commune on a material level, but also until we are able to more efficiently commune, you know, purely kind of on that cycular. But we're on the material plane, so these are things that are very helpful. Uh, but keep in mind your other tools, right? Because we're these dual beings and we're more of this other thing than we are the material limited creature. So, uh, but anyway, thank you. And then Karen, thank you for, uh, you know, holding uh, my hand. Uh, uh, through it and knowing that you know you're there to 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 backstop is very helpful and I appreciate it. So thank you all of you. Uh, peace profound.